The adventure begins, heading to uh, Abaco to dive blue holes, exploring caves and reaching out to the world with some really cool images. So Kenny, how was the crossing? The crossing, was sometimes you're the fly and sometimes you're the windshield. Yesterday we were the fly. So we left early a.m. for Miami, crossing the Gulf Stream, which it's only about uh, 100 miles, and had a few problems, lost our electronics, so we had to go by compass. You know, old fashioned, that's all right. We blew out our uh, water line for our fresh water tank, so we had uh, 100 gallons of water sloshing around near our electronics, so that was all right. Uh, a couple other minor incidents, but you finally you see land and you're like, ah, okay, we're almost there. First place you can clear uh, immigration and customs. And of course, you grab your passports. Well, I grabbed my passport. Tom, on the other hand. I, you know, I was living with that passport, like not gonna forget it, right? Well, I didn't forget to take it to Miami, but I forgot to take it to the Bahamas. <laughs> And my last words, leave Miami, is you got your passport, right, Tom? No, yeah, Tom didn't have his passport. I'll leave it at that. My immigration papers. <laughs> I'm Brian K. Cook, and I'm a professional cave diver. Kenny Broad, I'm a curiologist, and I do whatever I don't know about. Are you using UTMs, long slats, or uh, My name is Steve Bogart, and I uh, teach cave diving and exploring my free time. Uh, I'm Sebastian Kister, I'm a cave teacher and I'm developing software for cave serving. What are you guys thinking for diving tomorrow from the survey? Well, again, it's like establishing that main route between the two cave systems. So are we going to like place some uh, safety bottles to just live there for the next couple of weeks? Or? I have some old cylinders that I, I wouldn't mind sacrificing. The problem is, that, you know, here in, in salt water, it's different than putting safety bottles in fresh water. They start to deteriorate pretty quickly. Uh, you, you, know, you have it in the water for three days here, and you swim by and you can see the fizzing, mm -hmm. the aluminum media, fizzing. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so welcome to our expedition, the Abaco Blue Holes Project. I'm Jill Heinerth, and I hope to bring you a video blog every night so that you can travel along on this expedition with us. So Brian, one sentence or less, what's your best tip for explorers? For explorers? Never stop. <laughs> Selective amnesia. <clears throat> Keep your eyes open. Try not to ever be surprised. Uh, be prepared uh, and take your time, okay? The cave's gonna be there tomorrow, next week, or next year if you have to come back. So just go one step at a time and, and enjoy it. Hey, which way did it dump? You know, I've been diving with some of these guys for more than 20 years, and I have nothing but respect for this team. We horse around a bit, we have a good time, but in the end, we take things very seriously. And if you're gonna cave dive, you really wanna be in the water with someone who's of a like mind. We're risk averse, we take care of each other, we dive well as a team, and I think that's been the secret to survival and enjoyment on these expeditions. So Tom, happy birthday, man. Oh, well, thank you, Jill. So uh, how old are you today? A new day, a new, a new decade. <laughs> how uh, old? Seven zero, the big seven zero. Oh, yeah. People would find that hard to believe. Um, I find it hard to believe. I thought I'd be dead by now. I mean, you know how that is. Um, but here I am. So, uh, okay, on your 70th birthday, give us one tip for surviving on expeditions. You know, eat all the food you can whenever you can, even if it's somebody else's, because you never know when your next meal might be coming from. So yeah, this food's pretty darn good. I'm enjoying this. She's 
she sounds excited, but you guys don't sound excited. Are you guys excited? Yes! Ten minutes, ten seconds of oxygen, Ms. Moxie. You are better give me some more oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Ms. Moxie. Get out, Ms. Moxie. Oh, you're doing, doing real good. Oh, real good. Oh. <laughs> Come Watch on, Ms. Moxie. There's a stalactite right above you. Oh, Watch out. The last game. Oh, glory. <laughs> Come on, Ms. Moxie. I must be scared. <laughs> See how low that was? I think you're a brave woman, Miss Foxy. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. We're gonna take a white rock. See, there's nothing on it. Limestone, just what we're standing on, the same stuff. Same thing. So that's our bed rock, okay? So if you think water doesn't flow through rock, you're gonna find out because this is water with some coloring in it. And throughout the day, check out this rock and see what it's doing. We have the pinger. So the pinger is a device that Christina and Brian put into the cave. It sends out a signal through the limestone and then the kids can track it with a sort of radio locator that has a pinging. And based on how loud it is, they follow it, follow it, follow it until it stops pinging, which means they're directly over it. By coincidence, it happens to be right under the latrine, the porta potty. So the kids can at least conceptualize that whatever would go down here, whether it's sewage, whether it's pesticides, whether it's fertilizers, will actually end up right in the cave, which is where we drill into to get our drinking water. You guys are right on track. And the pinger is right underneath us. Whee! So that means that Dan's cave, where Brian enters in from the blue hole over there, goes all the way out here. Toilet's full of mysteries. I really thought that it'd be really disgusting that if you build your house on top of it, like the septic tank might leak and it'll like leak into the water and you'd be drinking um nasty waste like water. That was disgusting. disgusting. And that the pinger was actually under the toilet. And that it shouldn't be there because all the waste then goes down the blue hole if it was actually a real toilet. <laughs> So this morning's mission is to go in with some little plastic vials and after we've put in the location pinger, this guy right here, we're going to put that in the cave, it'll float vertically in the cave and then we're going to find it on the surface because it's going to emit some signals. And after that we're going to go and try to find some critters to bring up in little plastic vials so the kids can see them. And then after the kids leave this afternoon, we'll go return them to their watery home. Here comes our first question from Thunder Bay. Hi, my name is Brooklyn, and my question is, do have you ever encountered with any rare animals in the blue holes? We think that animals like the remipede, we think they've been around for over 200 million years with very little change. He's got little venomous pincers, so he can actually like lock onto something, inject venom, and kind of dissolve the thing and eat it over time. Whatever inside, like the meat or something, it turns into jello so that they could just slurp it up. Wow. Ugh. And it's got dozens of legs swimming around there, and it's actually the top predator. And you can see how tiny it is, 
but it's the top predator in the cave. And remember, it doesn't have eyes. It only senses from either vibrations or some kind of chemical signal in the water. Some of them are endemic. That means that they live only in one cave that we found them on the whole planet. And in some cases, animals can be endemic to a single room in a single cave. Now, there might be more of them on planet Earth, but there's not too many cave divers that can identify animals, so we haven't found them yet. Thank you. We'll see you again tomorrow. Loud as we can from all the classes out there. There's a lot of wizardry going on in the tent over here. We don't know if Corey took his medicine this morning. I'm going to use this for the kids uh, from the local school when they come by to show them, uh, show them some of these models uh, in augmented reality. And right away you look pretty funny, but you know, I'm used to that, so uh, even without it. So at any rate, what it just looks to everybody else, nobody else can see anything except for the TV and the camera here. But for me, I can see a whole bunch of stuff that we found underwater. You see this stalagmite in there? The big crystal one? Yeah, that's, um, that's right in this cave that's under your feet, and it's about 400 feet back um, underwater. So this is called augmented reality. Like virtual reality is the headset that you put on and you can't see anything else. You just see the heads, you know, the video game or whatever you're yeah. playing in the headset. But this is augmented reality so that you can see through it. Right there. And uh, it's really beautiful. I, when you swim up to it, you're swimming down this passage and all of a sudden there's this big beautiful red and yellow crystal. Stop recording. Thank you. All right, cool. These are some of the things that we're finding in the blue holes. We're finding them all over Abaco, and it's telling us about the ecology and those environmental systems from long, long ago. I'm looking at all of these different things that are happening and like being a detective. And if I find a single little bone, back in a cave, I'm trying to find out what that bone is and what the species was and why was it there and all of these questions. So it's like being a detective, sort of a natural history CSI. And all of these, these are called your postcranial bones. They came out of the body of this tortoise. Whoa! And this is the real tortoise that was found in Sawmill Sink. And it's very, very complete. You can even see the vertebrae inside of it. See it? This is the carapace and this is the plastron, their belly. These are called sulcus and these are the plates that go over top. They're called a sulci. So we have these lines and when they're kind of raised on the edge, we know that it was a youngster. When they get big, it spreads out. And also the sutures are like between each bone. So this is a separate bone from that. These are called costal bones. And when that suture gets really tight, it's an adult. But on the youngsters, it's not so tight. In fact, there may be a few gaps. See, along there and there, okay? So we know that it was sort of a teenager. <laughs> How about you guys? Are you guys singers? Every Heck night. Yeah, every day. Yeah, we go karaokeing together. Every every Tuesday, we go out to the karaoke bars and uh, right. It's our club. It's our it's club. Actually it's actually our thing. club. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> cool. <laughs> dumb ways to die. So many dumb ways to die. Dumb ways, ways to, to die. die. So, so many, many dumb, dumb ways to, to die. die. Skip the training for the cave. Don't fool yourself. You're not brave. Beyond your training and art, you'll end up permanently parked. Dumb ways to die, so many dumb ways to die. Skip a primary reel, you'll miss making the Christmas meal. Put in a visual gap, and you'll be swimming a terminal lap. Dumb ways to die, so many dumb ways to die. 
Don't analyze your gas. You'll be shaking on your ass. Blow past your thirds. You're really an insensitive turd. Dumb ways to die. So many dumb ways to die. Dumb ways to die. If you don't go freeway, you gotta die. Only to censors online. Don't do it. It's not fine. Skip your pre-dive check. Hope your buddy gives you heck. Dumb ways to die. So many dumb ways to die. Inspection failed pre-dive. You'll be lucky to stay alive. Dumb ways to die. So many dumb ways to die. Damn it, Jill, I can't do it. I can't do it. I don't care how long it took you to make up those lyrics. You can't make me do it. <laughs>Terrence over here, as far as I'm concerned, he's got the best job on the island. He, he takes care of these for us. Press it in just a little bit, and as you turn and you turn and you turn, it starts to like almost drill inside of it. Sometimes you need just a little bit of muscle to go inside of it, you know? And just turn and turn and turn and take this here, and you push it inside there. Give it a little nice twist to loosen it up. When you pull it back out, that same piece there. Yeah, it, it comes out looking just, just like, like that. that. And, and that's how you find the edge by counting the lines once we go straight through. If you run around, most of these trees around here are probably anywhere from, oh, I don't know, getting up towards 50 years old. Yeah, you know, they don't look real big, but that's how old they are. You have uh, a toothache. You take, uh, shave this off, but that long, and you take it and you put it inside your mouth and you clamp down on it, and what's going to happen? It goes go in half an hour or half a time it goes into stuff from eating. So this is very, very, very good. So always remember this and it's good for tea too. Okay? Very good smell eh? Alright, just break it up inside your hand and just smell it. Like how do you know what the what that plant looks like? Size of the plant. How do you know? I learned from my granny. Okay, for your grandmother. Who else learns stuff from their grandmothers? Anybody? I learned it from my mommy. From your mom? I learned it from the mom. Mommy. And grandmas and people like Marcus. You wake up in the morning, you're kind of... You take one of these, you guys ready? Oh, you're all on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so bush, so sweet so nugget, sand. Where do you get the best education? The world. The world. The world. Yeah. The world. The wood. Yeah. I went. All right, the woods. Where, yeah. where do you get the best education? You're, I really don't like the woods, but now I'm facing fears. Like life is supposed to teach. We get asked this all the time. Why on earth would you want to go cave diving? Most people think of caves and they think of a, a doorway filled with blackness. But for us, it's a portal to discovery, a place that allows us to swim inside the veins of Mother Earth. While we swim in these magnificent galleries, we're swimming through museums of natural history, through places that can teach us about Earth's past and Earth's future. It's a privilege to swim in these incredible environments and take in the majestic beauty that few people will ever have an opportunity to see. These caves are filled with crystalline beauty, with animals that have never been seen before, ancient swimming dinosaurs that can teach us about evolution and survival. The spaces inside our planet are filled with life, and with life-giving sustenance that feeds the planet and all of humankind.
cave diving is certainly not for everyone, but my colleagues and I pinch ourselves every day. We think we have the most beautiful office in the world, and we are incredibly grateful to the citizens of Abaco and the Bahamas for embracing us and bringing us into this incredible environment so that we can share the beauty, the art, and the science of underwater caves. My first trip here to uh, the Abacos was in 2003. I feel very privileged to have the opportunity to do original exploration in the 21st century. Probably around 20 to 30,000 feet of passage here. Uh, and go places that no one's been before, see things that no other human has ever seen. To be able to swim around a corner not knowing what's there, what you're going to find. Um, sometimes maybe nothing, but unless you go, you'll never know. So that, really that motivation just to work out um, this complex three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle that is hidden beneath our feet and it's such a unique and amazing and beautiful world. And the more I dive here, the more I explore, the more I appreciate it and realize how lucky I am to be able to do this. Both exploration and cave survey are, are truly are the basis of research diving. I mean, the scientists have no idea what's there until we tell them, until we explain to them what is actually there. And then they can go in and begin all the other ologies, um, you know, figuring out uh, why the cave is there and, and uh, what lives there and, and what, you need, what unique properties that cave might have for humans or for uh, other life. So, um, yeah, it's... it's um, there's there's nothing like these caves anywhere in the world. Moved here about 12 years ago. Swam through 50,000 feet so far, I think. Uh, explored maybe close to half of that, I think. Abaco is amazing. It's it's this perfect place where we have a perfect environment for what I'm trying to do here now with uh, cave research, cave exploration, and then running the commercial side as well. It takes a long time to survey an underwater cave. Imagine yourself in an overhead environment running a thin nylon guideline to create a super highway of tactile reference through the labyrinths. Then you have to very methodically, station by station, stop and take a compass bearing, measure the distance, and then swim along each course before a twist or bend in the line requires you to stop again and record the depth and all of the information around you. As a result, surveying a single cave can take months, if not years to complete. On this project, we're starting to experiment with a device developed by our team member, Sebastian Kister. This small, easy to deploy box is actually measuring the guideline optically as it slides through the device. It also keeps track of things like depth. So when you get back to base camp at the end of the day, you can quickly download the data and integrate it into a developing three-dimensional map. The future of cave survey is on our doorstep. 
Soon, we'll be able to fully map these systems in three dimensions using not just cameras, but scanning devices and even artificially intelligent robots. The more we know about these watery conduits beneath the surface of the Earth, the better we can protect the resources within them. These blue holes, you know, uh, act as a crystal ball. Uh, they uh, pretty much bring the past, you know, show us what historically what the you know what these islands looked like at one point and uh, brings it you know to the future so we could we could actually understand the importance of that we must protect uh, water resources here in the bahamas we must protect these fresh water lenses in particular these blue holes we must explore these blue holes more i'm sure there's a lot more that we don't know and organizations like the like the you know like National Geographic and all of the expertise that they bring to the table, we really cannot thank them you know for all that they have done and all they continue to do. This technology, wow, we can't pay for this stuff. The research behind it, we can't pay for this. The expertise, we can't pay for that stuff. It's great you know that National Geographic saw the need to come into come in here and actually do all that they're doing to provide us with that opportunity to gain more appreciation for what is there. We had a lot of collaboration between the Ministry of the Environment, Antiquities, Monuments and Museums Corporation, AMMC, Bahamas National Trust, Friends of the Environment being the local environmental group on the ground. And from here we want to more or less promote the importance of these blue hole systems, the cave systems. A lot of this cannot happen unless you know the government truly understood the importance of these things. And so the mere fact that they collaborated you know, supported, you know, the National Geographic team coming in, you know, says a whole lot. And uh, we want this kind of collaboration to continue. We want to see National Geographic doing a lot more in, in here to help inform us as a people and as a government so we could make better choices, protect more. I'm sure the kids would, they wouldn't forget what they've heard, what they've seen. I mean, now what they truly know. I mean, hearing one thing and knowing. You know, actually letting it digest is one thing. So when you take somebody to a site, you know, that says a whole lot. Oh, glory. <laughs> Come on, Miss Moxie. Come on, Miss Moxie. <laughs> <laughs>